Thank you, George. It's very nice to be here. Um, a very famous uh, French novelist of the 19th century, I think I might have even referred to him once before, the name of the man is Emile Zola. He wrote many, many novels in the 19th century. One of them was uh, on, the, on the development in the history of the department store. It was actually a novel, it was a love story, but it, he's so incredibly gifted in how he was writing about France and what was happening in France in the last half of the 19th century that actually this book is much more than just a love story. It's a story about really the history and the development of the department store as this great big mega institution, at least mega for its time. And in the book, um, there's a quotation by the, uh, by the hypothetical founder of this, or of this uh, particular department store, uh, which was called The Ladies' Paradise, in English anyway, au bonheur de dame in, in French. And, um, the, the, the quote is, there should be a crush at the entrance so that people in the street mistake it as a riot. And that's a, that I picture that. The store is going to open at 9.30, 10 in the morning, and all these people are waiting in the street for this wonderful big store to open so that they can go in and get these fabulous buys and all this marvelous merchandise. And two weeks ago, I was uh, in Florence, Italy, uh, with my stepdaughter, Mary Frances, and also my wife, Sally, who is here in the front, and also Caitlin, her sister, who's also here in the front. And um, Mary Frances took us to a restaurant in, uh, in Florence, a little kind of a bistro style of restaurant called El, El um, I, I, didn't, I have the name written down somewhere. But anyway, it's, it's, it's not important. Um, it's not important, but there's, we went to this restaurant. And um, Mary said, uh, I made a reservation. I had to make a reservation a week, a week early because this place is so popular. And uh, we got there, and uh, the uh, restaurant opened at 7.30 p.m., and we arrived at 7.20, and there were about 200 people in the front of this restaurant waiting to get in. Some of them had reservations, but the, pro the formula, the policy of the, of the house was that 50% uh, of the tables will be reserved, 50% first come, first served. And there's 200 people literally waiting outside of this restaurant in order to get in. And um, uh, the, um, the, the restaurant was quite fabulous. This is a restaurant with no menu. You just would go in and you would sit down and they would start serving you this remarkable Tuscan food. And at the end of the evening, and there's a great big double bottle of Chianti on the table, and uh, at the end of the evening, uh, you get your check, and you've had all this food, all these different kinds of things, including first courses, uh, all different kinds of things, main courses, different kinds of meats and vegetables and uh, side dishes like pastas and risottos, and then desserts, all, uh, big thing, all of them to choose from. And uh, at the end of the evening, and you get a check, and... Um, it's about 30 American dollars for all this food and wine. And um, uh, the interesting thing about this is that the, uh, there are these models all over. There's a, there are business models all over. And the, the genius, I think, of what we, set, we tend to do best in America is to take these business models and somehow rationalize them and develop them and so that they can be rolled out in a, on a much larger scale. I happened to talk to the proprietor the best I could. He, his English was broken and my Italian doesn't exist, and so it was kind of hard. But nevertheless, we, uh, we, we had enough of a rapport that, we, that I mentioned to him that my sons and I were in the Italian restaurant business in the United States. And uh, by the way, that got us a, a, the best table in the house. And um, then uh, we had a good time talking, and, and it's quite obvious that this man has a very, very successful business. It's also very obvious that he thoroughly enjoys what he does, and he does it very well. Um, the question is, uh, and, and, and like so many other, uh, let's say, Italian cafes and Italian coffee shops, um, they've existed there for hundreds of years, and yet an American uh, comes along uh, 20 years ago, not even, I think, maybe 18 years ago now, and um, he looks at this Italian coffee shop and he says, you know, my golly, uh, we need this in America. We need this quality of coffee in America. Uh, we need cappuccinos and we need lattes and we need fine coffee. They really taste like fresh brewed coffee 
uh, not just like the stuff we get in America. And uh, he comes back and he takes three little coffee shops, as we've, we've talked about, I think, in the previous class. And he takes three little coffee shops, and today that's 20,000 coffee shops around the world, all with the same name, Starbucks. And the company today has a market capitalization value of $29 billion. And the company's already announced that it wants to go from 20,000 outlets to 30,000 outlets in 10 years, 30,000 in 10 years, and the financial forecasts uh, are, the, the analysts think that means that the market capitalization value of this company will be $49 billion in 10 years. So here was an, an old concept that was reinvented in a sense and, and rationalized and made work in, in modern times. Um, I'm going to talk to you today about how we build a similar model, not in coffee shops, uh, but in a, in a formula type of restaurant that has the potential to go from a single unit to hundreds of units in a relatively short period of time. And those of you that might be interested in this particular enterprise beyond the intellectual um, uh, circumstances, if you want to be a part of it, we'll make you a part of it. Uh, because we're going to start it right here in New Orleans. Now, before we do that, we have to remind ourselves of some of the things that we talked about before. Um, we talked about, in, in one of the previous classes, about the, the concept of the downward circulation of artifacts, which is kind of a, a, a fancy word for uh, how goods and services sort of uh, uh, evolve and how they are distributed and how they are actually taken up and, and, and purchased by consumers. And uh, we did this, I think, in the automobile example. We said that if you go 40 years ago in the United States, uh, the size of the market for, let's say, fine cars uh, that had a certain kind of a fit and a finish and a performance characteristic was very, very small. And the people that made these cars were almost, almost all together in Europe, and the dominant players were Mercedes-Benz and BMW. And then all of a sudden, uh, and since we've done this before, we won't do it, uh, we won't take a lot of time on it. But now, if you look at the market uh, for, let's say, this high performance, high fit and finish, which was copied so brilliantly by the Japanese, uh, Honda is maybe the number one leading example of this, Toyota is certainly number two. Uh, the market today uh, has gone from this to this. Uh, why? Because more and more people are more discriminating. Uh, they're more aware of, uh, of how and why uh, things uh, could be better. And, of course, manufacturing technology has been radically changed in the last 40 years. So radically changed that a, that a brand new Honda made in the United States in Marysville, Ohio, has 18.5 hours of assembly time in the entire car. 18.5 hours of total labor in this car. Now that is not the total labor in the, in the unit because the labor that goes into, the, into preparing the dashboard and the seats and the motors is not in that number. But the total number of hours that it takes to assemble a Honda car from sheet metal, raw sheet metal, to finished product is 18.5 hours. Okay? And that's why you get this remarkable product a Honda Accord that starts at about $17,000 and then goes up to about $25,000, $26,000, depending upon engine accessories and so forth. So this is the downward circulation of the artifacts, which is this kind of anthropological concept, and the upward mobility and the, and the pre preferences of people, and that's what's happened in the automobile business. Now, I want, to re I want to tell you that that's happening in almost everything. It's happening in everything. It's certainly happening... And in a macro sense, the entire Industrial Revolution can be understood in this context. Because when the Industrial Revolution was really began in the late 18th century, um, we, the factory system, so to speak, if it took, before the factory system, if it took 20 hours, and of course they didn't make chairs out of plastic and nylon in those days, but if you just visualize for a moment, if it took 20 hours to make a chair, under the old system, under the new system, within about a very short period of time, two decades, this chair could be made in two hours instead of 20. And so basically, 
output in the world, in the Western world, Europe and the United States, to some extent Japan, a little bit later in Japan, uh, out, output increased tenfold. The pro productivity of the factory system was that dramatic. It increased about tenfold. And so, in a macro sense, uh, uh, in the old days, let's say by, at the time of the French Revolution, uh, 1789, uh, the only people that had any money, any luxury, or so forth, was, was, the, was the nobility, the very, very small amount of the nobility, and about half of that money uh, was in the hands of the king. And uh, so, that's the way it was. And then, what happened, of course, is that in the, in the 19th century, the factory system changed so that in a macro sense, what a few people had, now many, many, many uh, people had. And we can go from this, this macro concept uh, to a macro concept by industry, such as what we've already done in the automobile industry, but we could also do it like in, in many other industries. We could do it, for example, in the restaurant industry. Because very interestingly, today, over 50% of total food meals are taken away from the home. Now that includes uh, you. Uh, that also includes institutional uh, behavior, uh, in institutional consumption. In other words, when you eat over in the Dana Center, that's included in this 50 percent because it's not in the home. In other words, you're not cook buying raw groceries or whatever you now buy and and and, and serving it at home. And uh, I don't have to tell anybody here. The trend toward eating out is uh, is pervasive. It's uh, omnipresent. It's uh, it doesn't look like it's going to go away anytime soon. And so uh, we have had this same phenomenon take place in the, in the fast food industry, and it's most dramatic in the fast food industry. And we referred to Ray Kroc and the founding of McDonald's uh, uh, you know, before in, in, in a previous lecture. And what he basically did was kind of take this factory system, if you will, uh, the discipline of standardization, industrialization, and apply it to a segment of the, of the food business. And other people have done that to a certain extent beyond the fast food business as a whole new category, the most rapid growth category in the restaurant business is something called fast casual. That is to say, the best way to understand fast casual is that it has the simplicity and the direct access of fast food, but it has a quality of product and a menu assortment that is more like a real restaurant. In other words, uh, it isn't quite as, as uh, let's say, as simplistic as, and I'm not putting it down, hamburgers and hot dogs and so forth. And um, in, the, in the project that we've started, uh, Voodoo Barbecue and its spin-off Bamboulas, that's basically designed to be a, a fast, casual restaurant. That is to say, the barbecue that we serve is as good as it can be. Uh, now, of course, as many different people have different ideas about what good barbecue is, but um, in terms of the quality of product that is purchased, in terms of how the product is prepared, the slow cooking and so forth, and uh, how it is delivered, the whole goal of that company is to create a product, if you will, and a service offer so that this barbecue is as good as it can be. So that you could go to a very fancy restaurant in New York called Blue Smoke, which is a a New York style, if you will, uh, restaurant, but the barbecue will not be any better there than it is in, in our restaurant. That is at least the goal. And we're, we're doing pretty good on that. We have a ways to go, but we have, uh, we have some further. So in terms of fast food, this rationalization concept or this, this idea of discipline is, is very, very far along. As a matter of fact, many people are arguing today that one of the problems with the fast food business is uh, that it is saturated. In other words, there's hardly any room for any more new restaurants of this type. Certainly, the idea of coming in with a new formula is, um, is challenging, although it's amazing. There are people that are doing it all the time. There's a company out of Baton Rouge called Raising Cane. Some of you have been uh, to some of their restaurants, and it's a, it's, they, they sell only chicken, uh, chicken parts, and um, it's really kind of fast food. And we talked about fast casual a minute ago. And uh, so the, that, the question is, what's the future? Uh, where do you go from there? Well, you know, if you kind of go down the list in terms of types of restaurants, we go from fast food to fast casual. Uh, then we go to what we're going to call, I don't think this is a very good description, but I think you'll kind of get the idea, popular priced restaurants. 
And here we're talking about Olive Garden. Okay? Um, we're talking about Olive Garden. We're talking about uh, Red Lobster. Um, we're talking about companies of that type. Large companies, highly disciplined, chain, clearly chain operations. Uh, in, the, in every sense of the word, and uh, very, very popular and reasonable prices. And then um, we talked a bit about Bravo last time and what my family's been able to do in the, sort, in the Bravo Brio, and that's, uh, well, that's, that's not the category. The category would be what I'm going to call, not, the, not this one, but one above, and I'm going to call that smart casual. Um, again, there's probably better words for some of this. But the smart casual restaurant positions itself above this, but it's definitely not white tablecloth in the traditional sense. Is that making any sense to you? So in effect, smart casual is in between this and the ultimate in restaurants. Emerald Lagasse's restaurants, for example, here in town. John Besh's restaurants uh, here in town. These are very fine restaurants, very elegant restaurants, and of course, higher priced restaurants. So we've talked about this and the positioning of Bravo Brio as smart casual. We've also talked about the success of the company in terms of its sale. And then, of course, you've got what we'll call, we're going to call them, we'll just say these are real restaurants. Old-fashioned restaurants, somebody would say, but elegant restaurants. And these are, these restaurants in this day and age tend to be uh, celebrity chef driven. And if they're not celebrity chefs, they are at least well-trained, accomplished chefs, okay? There are people, they, these, these are restaurants where the cooking in is a very high standard, the, 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 the stuff coming in is, 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 is very carefully developed and so forth. And um, the, the, the most famous of these this day and age have these celebrity chefs. Now, that's kind of an interesting thing in and of itself. We don't have time to get into it here, but... Um, uh, you know, the, the country seems to be sort of gaga over uh, food and prepared food in restaurants and these celebrity chefs. And you know, uh, Emeril Lagasse is first and foremost an actor uh, this day and age. Most of his revenue comes from being an actor, not from being a, a restaurant tour. Okay. He also happens to have nine restaurants. Uh, these are difficult to operate. Many of them are kind of individualized and one of his challenges, of course, is how does he imprint his personality and his standards on nine different establishments, especially since they're quite different in character and in different parts of the country. Now, um, one of the things that's interesting, as you start looking at this part of the market down here, uh, is that this part of the market um, is, it tends to be, on average, older more sophisticated and more affluent, okay? And, and it's a little bit tricky because if you go, especially up into this smart casual thing, uh, you find that there were many people, let's say, that are, let's say, Loyola students or Loyola graduates, younger people uh, really like Bravo and they like Brio, which is one step higher than Bravo. Um, and so the market is, uh, is definitely fractionalized, but the preponderance of people that uh, support these kinds of restaurants tend to be older, uh, more affluent, better educated, better traveled, etc. And the interesting thing is, is to address the size of the market. And uh, one of the reasons that these restaurants have been so successful is that in the United States today, there are 109 million people that are 45 years of age or older. Now, demographically, let me show you what's going to happen. Demographically, this 109 million, the, you, you've heard, I'm sure, of the so-called aging of the population. Another kind of word for it is the, is the maturing of the baby boomer, etc. Most of your parents, for example, uh, are reaching this, this age and, and over. So, uh, you've heard that this market is growing. Well, this market is growing so dramatically that it's mind-boggling. Um, I have all the numbers here. I'm just going to give them to you very, very quick. 05, 10, 15, 20. 20 uh, this is 2025. Uh, okay. And this is, uh, 
2030. Uh, I've gone in 35 and on the 40. I've used this on purpose because this is kind of like your coming career lifespan. Um, but I, I, I urge you to be so successful that you can adapt the, the slogan of one of my good friends who says, retire alive at 55. Okay? So you don't have to go to 70 or anything to do this, but uh, if you look at the numbers, they're absolutely amazing. Uh, this is 109, as I mentioned, 109 million goes to 122. Uh, this goes to 132. This goes to 137. This goes to 146, 154. Uh, 161 and 168, uh, to put that uh, in, in different ways, we will have 59 million additional people over the age of 45 in this particular span of time. And guess what? This is not a guess. This is not a forecast. Why not? This is not just a prediction. What's so interesting about demographics here? This is an absolute fact, barring, of course, a famine or an atomic war or something like that. Why is that the case? Think about it. All of these people are already born. Okay? They're already born. So we know this is the number. We don't have to guess at it. Now, this number could be slightly higher depending upon the immigration policy of the United States. And, of course, it could be slightly lower if we had uh, another uh, ph phenomenal uh, catastrophe such as uh, an AIDS epidemic or something like that, uh, even multiplied by many, many times. But these people are already born, so we know this is going to happen. So there are going to be 59 million more people which is 54% more people in this category than there are at the present time. So if you want to jump on a trend, you want to go where the flow is, right? This is where the flow is. In other words, there are more, more people are going to be in this category than in any other. The other categories don't change hardly at all. 20 to 30, 30 to 40, those are very stable. Those are not growth markets in the context of numbers of people. But the, these people... And the money that they have to spend uh, is practically incomprehensible in terms of what that's going to do to change business in the future. So you want to try to get on some of these trends. Also, to the extent that we are, I don't know that we're really, really continuing, but in certain markets or growth markets, there are trends toward urbanization. The mar Las Vegas, for example, is, is growing, you know, like 20% a year. Phoenix is growing 18% a year. Uh, South Florida is growing... 15, 17 percent a year, and so the compound rates of growth of these markets is much greater than this, this U.S. population st statistic, so that if you locate certain kinds of innovative businesses in certain markets, you can expect to grow at a much faster rate than you could otherwise. Now, um, let's look at another, let, we've, we've looked then, this is kind of the market, if you will. Let's look just for a moment at the needs and the wants of this market. What are some of the needs and wants of this market? We could spend a whole class on that. As a matter of fact, we could spend a whole semester on that. We can't do that in this particular uh, course, but what we can do is perhaps just highlight the essence of why this market is growing and what are their needs and wants. Well, of course, uh, we, you know that this market, this older market that is more mature, better educated, better traveled, uh, these people want new and different things. They are much more appreciative of uh, Italian cuisine and French, maybe a new style of French cuisine. And, and uh, you already know what's happened to Chinese cuisine. Uh, there's another company at which we may have referred to, I don't remember whether we referred to P.F. Chang. But P.F. Chang, you know, is now a, 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 a company that is a multi-billion dollar company in terms of its market capitalization value, and it has about 110 restaurants. I haven't checked lately. It could be as much as 120 restaurants. And that is, that's because they're delivering a reinvented, if you will, a new kind of Chinese food. Just a little different than the family-run, the old-fashioned kind of Chinese restaurant. So the challenge, of course, is to, is to find out 
what it is about the taste of this market, the culture of this market, the ambiance of the restaurants and so forth, uh, that what is it that these people really want? Now we have to look at something completely different than that. Because what we're trying to do is to become sensitized to the environment. We've been on that subject before. We're trying to become sensitized to the environment so that we can capitalize on opportunity. And another way of doing that is to address the question, what is going wrong or what are the problems of the existing businesses that operate down here? And I want to submit to you that the problem of these businesses is that they haven't been rationalized, they haven't been disciplined, they haven't been made into uh, businesses that, uh, will, um, that will work efficiently. In other words, instead of, uh, instead of making these remarkable Honda Accords with 18 and a half hours of labor content, uh, what they're doing in, in, instead is, uh, is making old-fashioned uh, Rolls Royces, which are hand-built and hand-made, and have thousands and thousands of labor, labor hours in them. Now, I would submit to you uh, that there is a market for that. There, are, there is a, a, a market for Aston Martins and Bentleys, and, um, and uh, this new car that Mercedes just brought out, I can't remember the name of it. Um, the Maybach, which is a three hundred thousand dollar car, and so forth. There's a market for that, but it's uh, it's it's not a very big market. It's a very uh, esoteric market. It's a very fickled market, and um, uh, it doesn't really have a lot to do with what what's really happening for most of these hundred fifty nine million people. But how do we summarize the problems of the existing business that operates down here? The problems from an operating point of view. Well, you've heard all the stories about how hard the restaurant business is. You've heard how hard it is to get help. You've heard how hard it is to keep help, how hard it is to train help. And then in our country, we don't make it terribly easy uh, because our immigration laws are such that we do not allow a lot of quote-unquote professional uh, waiters who might come from Europe with a different culture. We don't allow them in our country. There are probably more good waiters in Toronto, Canada, uh, then there are all, there are there are more in one city in Canada there, than there are in the three state area of Columba, of, of Ohio, Indiana, and Illinois, which is th thirty million people. Why? Because we just in our immigration policies we do not permit people to come in and say we're a professional waiter. Uh, if they're a doctor or something, it may be different, but we don't think about this uh, the same. Now, uh, the basic problem then, if you look here. And I'm, I'm looking here but based upon a lot of experience, okay, with, with, with the family business, and looking here as an analyst, is that these businesses are run by artisans. Okay, they are run by artisans. They are not run by business people. Basically, they're run by artisans. And the better and the more unique the restaurant is, kind of the more artistic it can be. And it's quite interesting to think about this in terms of the word professionalism. We've gone over that before, too, and I've defined for you uh, the word professional, and I've said to you that a professional is an individual who has acquired an organized, codified, systematic body of knowledge. And that professional has then taken that body of knowledge and combined it with experience and technique. That's the definition. That's my definition of a professional. And um, we have now a whole new group of professional chefs. As a matter of fact, we have a very large school, a very distinguished place called the CIA, which stands for, not the government CIA, but this stands for uh, the, uh, the, the Culinary Institute of America. And it has several thousand students a year. So that if you really wanted to be a chef, one of the ways that you would accelerate your learning is to attend the CIA. And in the CIA, by the way, being an American uh, school, uh, you will learn a lot about being a chef and you'll learn something about business. But you won't learn, I don't believe, some of the really essential things that you need to know about business because they're going to they're gonna teach it to you from the status quo as opposed from uh, as opposed to being a revolutionary. 
And most of the people that graduate from the CIA call themselves what? Chefs, right? And they do have an organized, codified, systematic body of knowledge about food and cooking and, and cleanliness and all these kinds of things. And as they gain more experience working for the Emerald Agassiz of the world and the Ella Brennans of the world and so forth, uh, they get to be, they go from sous chef to real chef and maybe have their own business and so forth. And they are truly experts at that, but the problem is that they are artisans. They, are, they, are, they can do it very, very cleverly and very well in a single unit. Some, excuse me, some of them get so good at it that they can do it in two units or three units. But the idea of having really a, a superior quality restaurant at this level, or certainly at this level, uh, with a large number of them is sort of unimaginable. I remember not long ago when, uh, well, it was actually it was in January of this year, uh, my wife Sally and I, we had the opportunity to go to, uh, uh, we, went to, we went on a trip to South America, we were in Brazil, we were in Rio, and I asked the concierge at the hotel, I said, give us the name of a couple of really, really top restaurants, we'd like to go out to dinner tonight uh, and have something uh, quite special. And he said, oh, well, the best restaurant in, in Rio is uh, operated by one of the members of the Torgua family from France. Uh, the Torgua brothers have this very famous three-star restaurant in France. And this apparently was a nephew who had this marvelous restaurant in, in uh, Rio, French restaurant. So we went that night. And, uh, and uh, somehow I think I must have said to the concierge that, you know, uh, my family's in the restaurant business. And so we're very, and, and somehow this, the concierge, had communicated that to the reservation desk in this little restaurant. Not a very big restaurant, not really much bigger than this room. Probably only had about 80, 80 seats in it. And uh, we were there for about 15 minutes, and all of a sudden, uh, coming over to the table, as this uh, man in this gorgeous white, stiff, uh, white coat and uh, the toque hat, which goes up from here to the ceiling, and um, was uh, very gracious and wel welcoming us to uh, the restaurant and how pleased he was that we were there. And then um, uh, he said to me, he said, well, where is your restaurant? And I said, well, as a matter of fact, we have uh, restaurants in a number of different cities. And it sort of puzzled him a minute. And he says, well, um, just uh, where are these restaurants in, in, in America? And I said, well, they're in uh, uh, they're all over Ohio, There's, uh, they're in Pennsylvania, they're in, India in Indiana, uh, they're in Texas, they're in Louisiana, they're in Florida, they're in Georgia. And, he's, and he has this unbelievable look on his face. And um, somewhere in the, in, in the next two minutes conversation, uh, it was sort of said that there's about 50 restaurants involved here. And, to, and the, the long and the short of it, and from this man's point of view, it is impossible to have 50 restaurants. Completely impossible. There's no such thing as 50 restaurants. There may be 50-something, but they're not restaurants, okay? Because in a restaurant, you get up at 5 o'clock in the morning and you go to the market and you pick out the tomatoes. Okay? In this style of restaurant. And then uh, you take those tomatoes and you add, to, add some chopped onions, this, that, and the other, and then you blend them with the stock that's been on the stove the whole day before, Okay? And then you make this sauce, and then you do this, and you do that. And uh, when you get all done, you have this work of art. Follow me? That's a restaurant. Not what I'm talking about. How you can't have 50 restaurants. Absurd. Okay, that's the trouble with these Americans. They've got these goofy ideas. So um, anyway, um, here we are in this situation. You see, uh, um, we, he's a professional, but he has defined his professionalism in the context of being a, a cook, a fancy cook, uh, a celebrated cook, an accomplished cook, but basically his profession is cooking. And by the way, secondarily operating a restaurant. The restaurant is nothing but his platform for what? Cooking. That's his deli He could do it. What? There's another platform, which is a hotel platform. If he got tired of being in his own business, and he was a good enough manager, he could go and become a cook or a glorified cook, a chef, and I really am not trying to be disrespectful uh, to this remarkable growing profession. Uh, but, um, but he could do that, but basically his restaurant is a platform for what? 
his cuisine, his <coughs> cooking, his style of cuisine, uh, his attitude toward cuisine, the ability to create the perfection, uh, to, to, to be a perfectionist, etc. Now, my sons, on the other hand, they are also professionals, but they are not professional chefs. They're professional business people. And one of the reasons why you really want to take seriously what you're learning here, and probably uh, for a lot of you will go on and get an MBA sooner or later. Not all, it's not really necessary, but, um, uh, but there is, in fact, an organized, codified, systematic body of knowledge about the subject of business. And it's now quite, quite comprehensive. And when you combine that organized, codified, systematic body of knowledge about business with experience and technique, you have the opportunity uh, to grow businesses and do them in different kinds of ways. Okay? So the problem is that on the one hand, you've got these people over here who are professionals, professional chefs. And by the way, many of them, most in my experience, carry with them some extraordinary baggage. Okay? They really, many of them are rather proud of the fact that they really don't know much about business. Almost as bad as the medical profession. Okay? They're the worst. Okay? Because doctors really are doctors, and they don't want to lower themselves or really know much about business. Okay? But, and the chefs are that way too. We're really interested in cooking. Um, we're interested in that type of thing. On the other hand, you've got these people over here who are in, the, in business, like my sons, uh, who are running this organization with 50 outlets, 50 different restaurants, and they define themselves as having an organized, codified, systematic body of knowledge, uh, but it's about business, and, they, and they, their platform happens to be a different, multiple-unit restaurant. Now, what we have to do, I think, if you want to be innovative, is figure out a way to put these things together in a new way. And you start off with the vulnerabilities of the existing system. And the existing system is high cost, inefficient, backward. As a matter of fact, if you really stop and look at it analytically, uh, uh, one of these restaurants down here really operates today the same way that it operated 100 years ago when Ferdinand Point uh, who had the most famous restaurant in the world at the time. Or actually, it wasn't even 100 years ago. It was less than that. But Ferdinand Poir had a restaurant in France called La Pyrémy. And uh, yes, he did. He went to the market. When he couldn't go to the market, the market came to him with six ducks and three chickens, whatever it was. And um, he had this fabulous... Uh, it, he's a rem it was a remarkable man, by the way. He was very much involved in the whole codification of the food business. But... Uh, uh, that's how, how it was done. He went out and got it, they brought it to him, and it was a six of this and three of this and a dozen of this and five dozen eggs and so forth. And, that's, and the restaurant was local, okay? It was two or three times the size of this room. I've been there. And um, it still operates. Uh, of course, he's, he's long gone, but it still operates today. Very famous restaurant in the south of France. But this is very, very inefficient. This is very high cost. Um, and one of the problems, again, in America is that even though we're doing a great job at the CIA level try educating chefs and they're getting more and more experience, it's very hard to get good people to work for them in our country. In the first place, the social status of being a, a chef's helper in a kitchen is not a big deal in our country. Uh, secondly, um, uh, the mobility of the population is such that people will come and go, and if you've got people that will work for you even for a, a year, in some cases it, it, it's considered good. And so the training uh, issues are challenging as can be. And then as I think I mentioned to you also before, uh, uh, something like 20% of all kitchen help in many, many restaurant companies is illegal. And if we cut off uh, this illegal immigration, uh, into our country, um, it's going to severely impact uh, this industry, especially at this level where there's high value added, a lot of artisan work done here, and even more of it done down here. The other, now, there also in the environment, there's some interesting things happening, because in the environment, there, there, believe it or not, there is some technology that is being developed which is ex being accepted by these people, these artisans, very, very reluctantly because 
They are very proud and beat their chest telling you that everything we do is made from scratch. And everything is the very freshest ingredients. And you can't, you'd have to look at that and say, well, that's logical. We want, we want the very freshest ingredients, don't we? And we want everything to be made from scratch if we can afford it, and if it's really at this high level. But let me give you the facts. Uh, there's something called the, the, the method sous vide, which was actually developed in France, which in some sense is then maybe the epicenter of, uh, of the great cuisine. And uh, this was developed about 25 years ago, the method sous vide, and it had to do with the severe shortage of kitchen help in France. It had to do with the small size of the, of the kitchens in most restaurants in France, which would be only a half of the size of this room, which would be a huge uh, kitchen in, in a French restaurant. And uh, so someone uh, came up with a clever idea that instead of trying to make um, veal stock uh, in each restaurant, that he would make it in beautiful stainless steel vats at the very highest quality level. And uh, he would buy the very best marrow bones and everything else to make this stock. So every, all the ingredients would be as good as they can be. And the equipment would be state-of-the-art equipment. And then after the stock was, was made, it was then put into a cryovac bag, and the air was taken out of it. And this is all technology of the last 20 to 30 years. The air was taken out of it. And so what you have is a, is a perfect stock made as good as it can be, and it is put into a... A, a suspension, if you will, a time suspension, so that it is as good the seventh day it is as it is the first. It's good the fourteenth day as good as it's the first. As a matter of fact, it's good for thirty days. And so, if you use it anywhere within three weeks, you're home free, no problem at all. And when you open the bag, the taste and the consistency and the quality of what's in the bag is exactly the same as it is as or it would have been had you made it a day before. Okay? So this technology is now very, very well developed. Method sous vide, which started in France, is a huge thing. I go to any supermarket and you'll see those shrunken Crowback bags, right, around certain meat and so forth. And, they, and that means that the, many, it can be also frozen. That's another step. But um, so it's now possible uh, to achieve extremely high quality and deliver and serve the very freshest product with the very freshest ingredients, okay, and not necessarily have to do it the day before or the day of. About five years ago, when we were doing, when, we, when Bravo had reached a certain point in its development, we were having a lot of trouble getting consistency, growing from 25 restaurants up. And uh, we found out about a company in... Uh, in Orlando, Florida, by the name of Culinary Concepts. Culinary Concepts is, a, is, is actually started by a, a chef, a guy who used to be in the restaurant business. And he started a, he has a business now with a, with a 40,000 square foot facility, the most state of the art you could ever imagine. It's so state of the art uh, that, that when the product is taken from the cooler and put on the refrigerated truck, it's also refrigerated on the way from the cooler to the truck. Okay, it's absolute state of the art. It's what's known as a USDA, U.S. government approved uh, facility. So he can package and ship all through the 50 states. And um, so we, uh, we gave this company all of our recipes for soups and stocks and sauces. And we said, will you make these for us? And uh, all of the soups, all of the stocks, all of the sauces, uh, are made in this one company in Orlando, Florida, and shipped to the 55 restaurants on a weekly basis. People rave about the soups at Bravo. They rave about the sauces. If you remember or if you've been there, the, the people love the, the dipping oil and everything. All that is made in Orlando. And it's opened every day. Just cut the ba bag open, you, you heat it up, and you've got a perfect product. Now, in the few minutes that we have left, um, what I want to help you visualize is that that is expandable. But if you do it, you have to do it in a certain kind of a restaurant. 
because about 50% of the things that are sold in restaurants at this high end are, are service a la minute. That is, they are made to order. And that's good. And that's wonderful. But the other 50% are more what we would call traditional food. And by the way, there's a big trend now toward back to home cooking and traditional food. And so when you talk about things like bouillabaisse, when you talk about things like uh, um, uh, osobuco, when you talk about braised lamb shanks, all of this is kind of old-fashioned country food that is not made to order. As a matter of fact, it's made the day before or two days before because it needs two or three days in order to get really good. So uh, the idea would be, wouldn't it be interesting if you could put together a business that only kind of served these kinds of foods? Would that appeal to everybody? Of course not. But suppose you could also put this, this, this business together with a 30% underselling possibility. That is to say, instead of being prices the way they are now, you could offer in a wonderful, true restaurant environment all the decor and all the authenticity that you want. Highest quality food served in this environment, not the service a la minute, but the, you have this food and you'd offer it for 30% less. And I just wish we had more time, George, because basically it, it involves the fact that what's happened here is that everything has become average priced. Um, if you look, if you take a survey of all these so-called restaurants down here today, you'll find out that they are, with the exception of about a dozen, they're all within 10% of each other in price. And I'm talking about the small little goofy places on Magazine Street, all the way down to the fancy places in the French Quarter. They're all the same price, and they're all overpriced. But the reason they're overpriced is because they're doing things in this artisan way, okay? They're not taking advantage of technology. They haven't taken advantage of the new thought about how you could do it. But this kind of a business can be developed with a 30% underpricing capability. As a matter of fact, the prices that they're now getting for things are just incredibly ludicrous. Now, this business model is based upon um, just doing things in a whole new way, okay? Uh, because uh, uh, I, I just wish I had more time to tell you about it. There are 10,000 wine labels out there, okay? Nine of the 10,000 uh, cannot be marketed in the way that it's now marketed because it costs too much for a small winery to do that. So what does he do with his product? Uh, that product is available to be purchased uh, on a remarkable basis in terms of its value. Uh, not only that, there is in the environment, there is a huge wine glutton in, in, the, in the world, not just the, in the nation. But if you go back to this professionalism we were talking about, the organized, codified body of knowledge, we've taught so many people how to make wine, real wine, good, that it's now being done all over the world. So in, in the past, 25, 30 years ago, when it was mostly French and Italian and a little Spanish, now it's everywhere, in Chile and Australia and New Zealand. And, uh, it's just good wine is coming from everywhere. And so the, the opportunity to really put on a really good meal and offer to people at a reasonable price, it's there, okay? Because if you prepare the soup properly, unless you're talking about lobster bisque or something like that, you're talking about 50 cents of cost. If you're talking about a salad, a great salad, you're talking about another 50 cents of cost. If you're talking about an entree with, of this kind of traditional food that we're talking about, you're looking at about $2.50. And if you're looking at a dessert, we're talking about cost. Um, you're talking again about 50 cents. And yet, what's happening in these restaurants? You go into a restaurant today, and what do you find? You find that the, sa that the, that the soups, uh, where they have them, the soups are, um, are, are always, um, they're, they're, well, they're, they're, they're very expensive. In other words, they want $5 to $8 for soup. They want $6 to, to $8 for, for salads. And they want... Um, you know, entrees start at 14 and go to 25, and I'm not talking about emeralds at 30, uh, and so forth and so on. Well, they have to charge this much because they're low volume operations, and they're doing everything in this artisan way. There is another way to do this. The bottom line is this, that um, if, you, if you can create this kind of a business, and I really unfortunately haven't done this in a while, George, and so I guess I, I missed on the time, and I apologize for that, but if you could actually create this kind of a business, let's say year number one and number two, uh, that is 2007 and 2008, 
uh, you only have one restaurant because you're perfecting a concept, okay? So here's 2007, 2008, and there's only one. But then uh, you get it down, and you're now, you're, by the way, maybe another word that'll help you understand this would be the word commissary kitchen, because most of this stuff is going to be prepared in a, in a small factory. Very sophisticated, best fresh ingredients, the best equipment, the best containerization, and so forth. But it's going to be prepared in a small factory. So you have one outlet there. And uh, so that's the total number of outlets that you, that you have. One, uh, this, is the, um, this is the number that you're adding, and that's one, and this is your total over here. And let's say, however, in year three, this is year number one, in year, in year three, uh, you, add, you add another outlet. So you add one, so you have a total of two, and you're really getting it going now, and so in year four, uh, you add two. And so now you have four. And uh, in year five, um, you add four. Because, again, these restaurants have discipline. Remember, they, don't, they hardly even have kitchens in them. Okay? Because the kitchen is somewhere else. And you're shipping all this stuff. And so they've got kind of glorified <coughs> steam tables. A little more complicated than that. Involves some sophisticated equipment and so forth. But, but it's not like doing everything where you call up and get six chickens and 12 ducks. Are you with me? Because it's done, that's done for you somewhere else. And so you have five, and then you go to six, and then you go to seven, and you go to eight. And I've said that in year five, uh, we're going to add four. In year six, we're going to add eight units. In year seven, we're going to add 12. And then we're going to add 14. And, uh, and then um, I sort of cut back. Uh, you can't just keep going uh, you know, exponentially. So therefore, I've cut it back, but anyway, to make a long story short, at the end of 15 years, uh, which is not an unreasonable period of time, between now and the year 2022, you would end up with 150 restaurants. Now, remember, my sons ended up with 55, and they were doing it in this quasi-old-fashioned artisan manner. Are you with me? They're not quite as artisan as down here, but, but in spite of the stuff we're getting from, from Orlando, Florida, a lot of stuff is coming in and being chopped and made every day. Okay? They got 55 in, in 14 years. With this disciplined approach, we're saying we can do 150 restaurants. Also, we're saying uh, that these this 150 restaurants uh, could generate $3 million in volume per unit. We think that's reasonably conservative, considering that we've already achieved something where Bravo, the average Bravo, does 4.2 million, and the average Brio, which is the high-end Bravo, does closer to 6 million. So these numbers are not, you know, these are not just whacked out numbers. These are reasonably conservative numbers. Well, 150 restaurants times 3 million, of course, is $450 million. Now, um, the average restaurant, um, if you look at their cost structure, the average restaurant in, in the country today um, will have a cost structure with about 32% labor and 32% uh, food cost, that's food and wine uh, blended, which is 64% of, of cost goes into 64% here, okay? Now, they'll also have 9% in rent. And they will have 19%, they'll have 19% in everything else. So that their cost structure is 92% of sales, and that means that the profit pre-tax is 8%. That's average. We're saying that this new formula restaurant can do better than that. Because we're going to buy in larger quantities, we're going to have much more discipline over production, we're going to have much better understanding of quality control and also portion control in the old-fashioned way. And so instead of 32 percent, we're going to have 29. Also, since we're not going to have all these people all over all these kitchens doing all this kind of stuff in an artisan manner, uh, we'll still have, of course, help in it, but we're going to have 29 here. Okay, so the 29 and the 29, obviously, uh, they're better. And then uh, we, we're going to, the rent's going to be the same. We don't see why this new formula can do much to reduce the rent, but we think we can probably get one point out of all other because we're going to have simpler operations, more discipline, more everything. 
And so we get one point. So in effect, this becomes 85 and the pre-tax profit becomes 15% instead of 8. Okay? Now, uh, the unit economics are rather interesting. If one of these artisan restaurants on Magazine Street does a million dollars, okay, and they make 8%, that means that he's got $80,000, plus maybe whatever his salary is. Not a bad living, by the way. Nothing wrong with this in terms of being a bad living. But as my son would say, to be somewhat cynical, the guy that owns this kind of restaurant and operates it in this manner has bought himself a job. Okay? Not only that, he's bought himself prison because he's not big enough to ever go away. He can't get away. He doesn't have any real partners typically and so forth so that he's really, he's there. And if you're open seven days a week in this restaurant, you're going to kill yourself. Okay? Basically. Now, our business, and so that business throws off $80,000. Our business, on the other hand, if it does $3 million in volume and we get 15%, it's going to throw off $450,000 per unit. Okay? And at $450,000 per unit, everything changes. Everything becomes alive and well. Because... At $450,000 a unit times 150 units, that turns out to be, um, it's 450, it's $45 million in sales. It's after tax profit at 15% is going to be uh, $47 million, 250. And if you had this kind of an accomplishment, if you actually did this, what do you think that company would be worth? If, it's doing, if it has four, this is pre-tax, but no, this is, this is after tax. Pre-tax is 67.5, and I apologize for trying to go so fast. The next time we'll have a better understanding of pace and momentum. Uh, what do you think this company's worth if it, does, if it is $47,250,000 in after tax profits in, in, in the year 2022? Have a guess? Well, let's, let's say that uh, to be sort of in the middle, if you had that kind of performance, that kind of growth record, uh, the company would be worth probably about 22 times earnings. Which is another way of saying that if you could accomplish this and you were able to accomplish it on internal growth, which is a whole other subject of whether we could do that or not, you would have become a billionaire because 22 times this is $1,395,000. One billion three hundred and ninety-five zero. Oh, I got another. I got, I got the. I got this in the wrong. I got this in the wrong place. There you go. So you're a billionaire. One million. One billion. $39,500,000 is what you're worth. Okay? Now you say, that's completely insane. Howard Schultz is a billionaire and he owns, only owns 7% of Starbucks. The multi billion. Okay? We've already been through the Sam Walton story, haven't we? The family's worth $90 billion doing something as mundane as. Uh, as discount retail stores. In other words, this is not biotechnology. This is not, um, you know, this is not cutting edge science or anything like that. This is just something else. Now, whether you could do that all internally financed, much more complicated than what we've talked about here. Um, and I want to tell you one other thing. One of, the, one of the other reasons that this is worth 22 times earnings is because at the end of this, when you're doing uh, 450 million in sales, um, you really only reached approximately 1.8% of all the people in America that are over 55 years old. I'm sorry, 45 years, 45 years old. That's assuming, there's an assumption in that, that your customer comes to your restaurant five times a year. Now, I got all these numbers. 
five times a year. So basically, you tell you, if you if you just take all the numbers, you 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 bring it on down, you're still only touching the market. You're only you're only kissing the market. So um, this was just a, the the purpose of this business model was to. Um, kind of give you a, a, an insight and not something that has happened, but something that could happen, okay? And how you go about evaluating the environment, looking for the vulnerabilities in the present system, looking for the opportunities as they might exist in terms of the demographics of our society, looking at the socioeconomic trends in terms of consumer preferences and everything else. And there's a lot more that we could do. Uh, this is all we're going to do here. But maybe, um, George, if we can, maybe we may want to take some of these things and develop it into a course uh, where we have enough time to really uh, get, get, up, get on top of just this veneer, okay? And those of you that are interested in pursuing this kind of as a, if you want to do it a hands-on thing, um, we're cooking up something, and then we're cooking up a version of this, which is um, really going to be driven from a wine, a wine point of view. There's a huge trend in the country toward wine bars. Part of it has to do with the 10,000 labels. Part of it has to do with the plethora of wine that is in the world. Part of it has to do with the, with the destruction of conventional legal structures that, are, that, that, that prevent wine from being sold like every other product. There's all kind of special legal issues and they're going away because the Supreme Courts of most states are saying this is in restraint of trade. Wine is really no different than any other product. Why does it have to be especially categorized? So all of these things are going to make a new kind of wine bar possible where you can come in and taste the wine. You order online by the case and you get great values in the wine it gets delivered to you. At the same time while you're there there's no reason why you can't taste some of this food. And uh, so if you're interested in that um, let us know because Caitlin's going to run it, and uh, so uh, and she's had a lot of ex she has a lot of experience now with her, and she's an MBA here. Uh, she's an MBA student at Oil, so she's getting the academic while she's also going to do the practice. So that's all we have time for. I hope it's given you a little different insight than you had before about how you create a business. <laughs>